Okay, we're going to discuss uh, section 11.4, equations of simple harmonic motion. Now, get ready for a lot of math in this particular section. Uh, since this course is more geared towards people that have had trigonometry but not yet calculus, the approach on this is going to be a little bit different. And the reason is, um, the way uh, somebody with algebra is going to look at this, we're going to look at this with vectors as opposed to a particular function, which is the way you would look at it in calculus. Um, you're not uh, privy to exactly what derivatives mean yet, so we're going to focus on this with just how the vectors appear and how you can use trig to get to these answers. But it is complex, so I'm going to try to go over as many of the details here as possible it's gonna be easier for you to go through and to look at the summary first. And when you look at the summary first, you're gonna be able to see uh, what the conclusion is. And as we work towards it through the algebra in the actual section, then you can kind of see where, we, you know, where we're supposed to arrive. So uh, we're gonna obtain uh, the equations describing uh, SHM. Uh, by using the circle of reference. Now we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, we're gonna consider a point that moves counterclockwise with constant angular velocity around a circle of radius A. So we've got this point Q that is going to be moving around the circle. Now, when it moves around the circle, what we're going to be looking at is a projection on the x-axis of where this um, point Q happens to fall if we were to draw a line from the x-axis up to there. This point P is going to be following along and just sort of bouncing along, oscillating here along the x-axis as the point Q moves around the circle. When we go through and we evaluate the x components of the, of the point's position, velocity, and acceleration, what we find is that x is going to be equal to a times the cosine of omega t, or if we look at it in an angular sense uh, uh, and trying to introduce the concept of frequency, it's going to be a times cosine of 2 pi times the frequency times the time. The velocity of x is going to be equal to minus omega a sine of omega t, uh, which is going to be equal to minus 2 pi f a sine of the same argument, the trig argument that we had up above. The acceleration is gonna be equal to minus omega squared a cosine omega t, and then finally uh, that expression there. So these are going to be the vectors that we're going to see. You've got a, a position vector here of x, which is gonna bounce back and forth. You've got velocity vectors, which the velocity of this particular point is gonna be off in this direction. But remember, we can look at it with certain components. When we look at it with certain components, this is the expression that we come up with as far as what the velocity in the x direction happens to be. We take this angle into consideration, we take the velocity here and we take its component here. We have to include a negative term in order to make sure that uh, the values of the velocity are matching the direction that it's moving. Same sort of thing goes with the acceleration. The acceleration is always going to be pointed inward into the circle. Uh, we're going to take the components of it and we're going to take the velocity at this point uh, a sub q multiply it by the cosine here because trigonometrically we're looking at the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse in order to be able to get this value. Now, the math involved in this is going to be, um, <clears throat> you're going to have to keep track of a number of things as we go through. Uh, so this is going to be a lecture you're going to have to go kind of trace back uh, through the text to kind of see where we end up. Um, what we're going to end up doing is using something called um, a circle of uh, reference. Imagine having, for those of you that have, <laughs> I suppose at this particular age, you may not have seen this yourself, except in maybe a, a uh, antique shop or something like that. But if you had a record player, 
and you marked a point, you put a record down on the player, and you marked a point out on the circle. And let's say that you decided not to look at it straight down, but you decided to look at it if you flip that 90 degrees so that you're looking at the light beam as a light beam is shined for this, from this direction onto some sort of vertical screen that's right out there to the side. This is standing up and the light beam is causing this point to make a projection here. As this um, point Q turns around the table, it's gonna create a shadow. And that shadow point P, the shadow of the ball, is going to go over here, and back over here and back over here as this thing rotates around. What we're going to attempt to do is try to uh, find equations that make the motion of this in one dimension in the x, di uh, x direction equate to the motion of this as it's moving around the circle. So that's going to be kind of a kind of a neat uh, synopsis of what it is that we're going to be attempting to do. And that's what the picture in the summary was trying to do. If we look at a ball in uniform motion, we look at its projection along the x-axis, uh, what we're seeing here is that x is going to be equal to this vector a times the cosine of phi, which is the um, angle that's made with the x-axis. So again, remember that we're going to be moving with a um, angular velocity. This angular velocity, uh, omega, is going to be equal to delta phi divided by delta t. Uh, and again, this uh, angular velocity of this ball is going to be measured in uh, radians per second. And it's going to be equal uh, to the angular frequency of the shadow's uh, simple harmonic motion. So now we're going to prove that the horizontal component represents the actual motion of the shadow. Um, so here we go. X, as I pointed out above, is gonna be A times the cosine of phi. We also know that the angle, if we were to take it and divide it by time, would be the angular velocity. So therefore we can take this equation using this knowledge and rewrite it as x is equal to a cosine of omega times t. Okay, that in and of itself doesn't look too bad. Now, we wanna take the angular velocity of q and we wanna relate it to the frequency or the number of complete revolutions that that uh, ball on the record makes per second. We learned in one of the previous sections that the angular velocity is going to be equal to 2 pi times the frequency. Since we know that, we know that our angular velocity is here. We take this, substitute it in here, and we come up with this. Now, we are interested in the tangential speed and how that relates. Um, to the velocity that uh, is parallel. Um, when we do that, we know that the velocity that is parallel is going to be equal to omega times uh, the amplitude, which we know what the angular velocity is going to be. So we know that 2 pi f uh, can replace that. And so this is what we're ending up with. Now let's find uh, find out what we mean here. We know that um, a VQ is going to be equal to that uh, parallel velocity. We're taking its component here. This is what we're finding right here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So point P is always directly below. So the velocity of P at each point must be equal to the X component uh, of the velocity of Q. So in other words, uh, v of x is going to be equal to this times the sine of theta. If we have all of that information uh, placed in here, we know that we can go through and we can replace uh, omega with 2 pi times the frequency. So we end up with this uh, long piece of information here. 
The negative sign is needed at the instance shown because the direction of the velocity is towards the left. When Q is below the uh, horizontal diameter, the velocity of P is towards the right, but sine is negative at such points, so the negative sign is needed in both cases. In other words, that, that sign there allows us to be able to uh, generate the correct value, so that's why it's in there. When it comes to acceleration, uh, we know that the acceleration of Q is pointed this way, and that's going to be the same as the radial acceleration. The radial acceleration we know is omega squared times A. Uh, then once we make the replacement here for uh, two pi F, everything gets squared. Then A sub X is gonna be equal to minus the um, radial acceleration times the cosine of phi. Or as we go through and make the replacements, we end up with this. Again, the negative sign is needed because of the instant shown, the acceleration is towards the left. When Q is to the left of the center, the acceleration is towards the right, but since cosine is negative at such points, the negative sign is still needed. In other words, that negative sign there is thrown in in order to make sure that the computations come out. Bottom line, uh, as we go through this, blah, 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 we know that A cosine of omega t is the same thing. If we scroll all the way back up here, it's the same thing as X. So when we go through and we make the replacement, we call this X. The acceleration in the X direction is the same as minus omega squared times X. This is important. And the reason that's important is when this is constant, the acceleration uh, a sub x at each instance equals the negative constant times the displacement x in that instant. In other words, this is a constant. This is working against the displacement. That means that this motion is considered to be simple harmonic. So we can use those tools in order to be able to uh, uh, analyze this particular situation. Now, the kicker is, is that we want to make sure that this motion right here, this angular description, matches what's going on in the linear sense. In other words, the motion of this thing is it moves back and forth. We already had that motion of moving back and forth from Hooke's law. Force is equal to minus kx. In order to be able to make sure that that motion matches the angular motion that we've seen in the circle of reference, we need to define uh, omega or omega squared as k over m. And the reason for that is that when you do that, this becomes, uh, let's see, a is equal to um, minus, uh, right, minus k divided by m times, let's see, what do we have up here? Oh, it won't let me write it. Um, k over m times x. You rearrange all of that, or it becomes mass times acceleration is equal to minus kx, which is equal to the force. That's why this is defined in this way, in order to be able to um, calibrate those two formulas together. So once we've done that, the frequency of motion of Q is equal to the frequency of the simple harmonic motion of the actual particle P. This is not giving up. Okay, there we go. So, to summarize all of the lengthy blah, blah, blah that I just said, the frequency is going to be equal to the uh, angular velocity divided by 2 pi, which we've now defined this as the square root of k over m. Uh, the period is going to be 1 over the frequency, so we take uh, the reciprocal of this, and this is what it ends up looking like. Frequency is going to be in hertz, the angular velocity is going to be in radians per second, and the 
the period is going to be in seconds. The frequency of simple harmonic motion does not depend on the amplitude of the motion. And um, omega is the angular frequency and is not to be confused with angular velocity. It's uh, unfortunate that they kind of used it for the same thing because that can cause some confusion. So it may be surprising that these equations do not contain the amplitude A of the motion. So suppose we give our spring mass system some initial displacement, release it, and measure its frequency. Then we stop it. Then we give it an, a different initial displacement, release it again. We find that the two frequencies are the same. So to be sure, the maximum displacement, maximum speed, maximum acceleration are all different in the two cases, but not the frequency. Uh, when the amplitude is increased, the mass has a greater distance to travel, but the force and acceleration are also greater. So those two effects exactly cancel. So if we go through, we've determined here that the acceleration in the x direction is equal to minus k over m times x is equal to that. That means the velocity in the x direction, if we solve for it, turns out to be plus or minus the uh, angular frequency times the square root of a squared minus x squared. So by using um, the angular frequency as opposed to just the regular frequency, it lets us avoid a lot of factors of two pi. So to summarize, x, vx, and ax are all listed here. A is in units of meters, f is in hertz, and the uh, angular frequency is in radians per second. And you can see here the graphs. Uh, this is gonna be the time. This is gonna be the position. And so you can see it starts at a maximum displacement of A, goes to minus A, back through zero, back to A, and then back to minus A and so on and so forth. The velocity starts out at zero and then goes uh, down to uh, minus uh, omega times A and then back to zero and then to omega A and then so on and so forth. The acceleration, is that minus omega squared a goes through zero, and then goes to omega squared a, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, all throughout this discussion, we've assumed that the initial position x naught of the particle is the maximum possible uh, positive displacement. But the analysis can be adapted to different starting conditions. It may not start at that, con at that particular spot. Uh, different initial positions correspond to different initial positions of the reference point Q. So, uh, of course, we can't make things uh, any simpler, so we have to complicate them. The way we do that is we say, okay, maybe it starts at a different point, and it, maybe that points at a certain spot where it makes a certain angle. When we do that, we put in the angle, and so that... Um, our position or angle at any particular time is going to be wherever it starts plus the angular frequency times the time. Thus, the position is not written with just omega t, but omega t plus uh, phi naught. So with the appropriate choices for your amplitude and your starting position, this gives a more general expression that can be used to describe motion with any initial position and initial velocity. And as before, the period and frequency are independent of the amplitude. There are more examples here for you to go through and I encourage you to do so.